Lord Jess, Papi, hit me one time and make it funky. I was brought up and told to have no Welcome to the Full Circle Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, David Roberts, along with the OG Dr. Neil Holmes and the oral historian Andre Taylor. Today, we have a special guest with us, a classmate of mine from way back at the University of Akron, Akron uh, Mr. Welby Broadus. Welby Broadus is the chief executive officer of the consulting firm Broadus Business Solutions. As a visually impaired business owner, he hopes to use his influence to help the less fortunate and those without a voice. Welby wrote the book, Leading Blind Without Vision. And he wrote this book to educate business owners, executives, and HR professionals on the benefits of hiring individuals who are blind and visually impaired. He hopes to use this book to help educate the business community about the qualities and skill sets that the blind and visually impaired community can bring into the workforce or the workplace. Uh, Mr. Broadus, welcome, sir. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Dave, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Big fan of the show. Oh, thanks, man. We, we appreciate that. Um, let me get into the obvious question, probably that a lot of people will have. And then, you know, before we get into this, what are the benefits of hiring the blind and visually impaired? Of course, I believe, don't believe in discrimination at all, but what are the benefits that you talk about? So a lot of benefits is they're the most loyal and dedicated employees because you got to realize a person who's blind and visually impaired, when we get a job, we gonna keep a job because if we lose a job, it's hard for us to find a job. Where the average person, they can lose a job, probably get another job like in the next week or a month or two. It'll take take us forever because employers don't are uneducated and unsure what we're capable of doing in the workplace. And twofold, and why is a problem? Because you know somebody that's blind and vision impaired, our visions are different. Still, there's like over like a thousand different eye, eye conditions, so no two people may not be alike. So what I might need to accommodate me on the job, somebody else may not need, or some things I don't need, somebody else may need. And that's the, and that's the free employers have. And so we more, we're loyal, we're dedicated, we're great problem solvers, because you gotta realize we navigate through a world every day that's not set up for us. So we gotta figure out how to get around every day to get to work, get to the grocery store, get the things that we need to survive in life just like everybody else. But we gotta come up with a plan on how to do that. Um, also, we are, we, we're tuned to more, we, we're more motivated. Uh, we, we have our, our senses are enhanced. You know, people had a myth talking about, oh, you, they have better senses. So I did my research on the book. And what happens is, since I, especially those who are born vision impaired or blind, our, our senses tend to pick up on that. So they pick up our other sense, enhance our other sense, senses to, to take a place, to be in place of, of our vision. And that's one thing as well. So, and those are just some of the other things. And we, like I said, we're great problem solvers, dedicated and loyal, and we're more motivated to work as well. Now, this is the first time I've heard of a book of this nature. So, you know, to me, it's, you know, I'm like, wow, this is very unique. But is it just because I'm not in the blind and visually impaired community? Are there lots of books of this nature out? So I'm glad you asked that question. So when I was going through the right press to write my book, through, the, through Georgetown University, it's called uh, the Creator Institute. And my first editor, we call it a D with a distributing editor. So, I, and she actually, she, she's, she has a disability as well. So I was telling her, I'm gonna I write this book. I'm gonna write this book about me. She's like, so you wanna write a memoir? I said, yeah, I'm gonna write a memoir. So she let me start writing for a few couple of weeks. Then finally we met, she said, so I got a question for you. You writing this memoir, right? About you being vision impaired, right? I said, yeah. Who's gonna read your book? I'm like, who, what you mean? I mean, normally people who like ex-politicians, celebrities, they write memoirs because they already have a following. Right. Who knows you? And so I, I, I like this lady tripping. So I said, now I thought about it, you right. So she wanted me to write a book on to help the blind and vision period get jobs. And, and like I told her, I said, well, you know, we already know how to do that. I said, because we go through all types of vocational rehabilitation training to navigate in life, how to get jobs. So I said, I'm going to flip it. I'm going to write a book on how to educate the HR professionals, executives, and business owners on the benefits and how to onboard us into their into the organizations. And so 
as I did my research and I would talk to like professionals in the field, they said, man, this, there's never been a book written like this. This, this is like the first book that ever be written like this. And I didn't think about that. I just, I just, I, honestly, I just let God lead me, but, and it just took me there. And that's, that's how there's evolved to the book. Uh, what what are some of the uh, key key topics that are in the book? Some of the things that you cover in the book. So, first of all, the, the first section of the book basically deals with the history of basically blind and vision impaired and disabilities in the United States. Um, a lot of people don't know that disability came up because of back in the um, during the Civil War when the soldiers got injured and they come back home they couldn't work in labor because they basically was hardcore labor back then. So they came up with a disability form so they can get a pension. Then it evolved to the industrial revolution, immigrants coming to the United States. And at this point, there was no law set up for like, hey, you got to hire disabled people. There was no law. They, they, they just basically, I'm not hiring you, get out of my shop. It was so bad that they didn't even have to allow us into a store. If you were a disabled person, they didn't have you, they can tell you, you can't come in here. And they never had accommodations anyway. So <clears throat> that's that's the first section to deal with the history, the technology. The second part basically goes over all the skills that the blind and visual pair bring to the organization, like dedication, loyalty, problem solvers, things like that. Now, the third section, is, I think, is probably the most key section to me, because it deals with working with HR professionals and how they can onboard this population to the workplace and things like that. Okay. And, 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 and how do, how do, um, from, from the business side, let's say a business owner becomes, um, sensitized, so to speak, and, and wants to hire somebody that's uh, visually impaired. Uh, how do you, how do you get people into that, into the, um, into the pipe pipeline? How do you so, get folks into that pipeline? So um, there's so like there's every every state has at least a vocational rehabilitation service. Every state in every U.S. territory, and actually it's just in the back of my book, I put them all in there. But a lot of states also have the Bureau for the Blind and Vision Impaired. All these agencies deal with these clients. They teach them life skills, basically how to live on their own. Also teach they they actually send them out and have them learn aptitude tests. There's all types of skills to see what jobs be, they'd be good at with their conditions. Then what they like to do, they like to partner with organizations to find their clients' jobs. So this is a win-win for an organization. If you partner with your state blind, blind or vision impaired service or rehabilitation service commission, you're going to get already trained workers who are ready to work. And I, and I suggest that because what they do, they're going to teach, they're going to teach the organizations on how to accommodate these, these people. And also they're gonna make sure they, they, they abide by ADA guidelines as well. So it's a win-win for the organization to get this, this untapped market, especially now what's going on, like people not trying to go back to work and things like that. This is a prime time to at least get this population a chance because they won't, they won't let you down. So now I have a question, it's kind of it's twofold. Um, so this book is written more for the HR professional to understand how to onboard uh, blind and visually impaired people. Uh, I guess the first part of my question is, have any of these HR people reached out to you uh, for one-on-one -on -one help to un get a better understanding outside of the book? And two, have you ever thought about taking the book and this knowledge and partnering with an HR firm to have like some type of a conference or be a part of a conference uh, so that you can have a workshop to teach them. So that that's a good point. So I just I, I just hired me a public assistant, and we actually we just met on Monday. Talk about the same thing you're talking about. So actually, now she we not just like some conference like SHRM, the Society of H Human Resource Management Society. That's real big. Reaching out with them, like local chapters and things like that, and some universities that have like HR clubs and things like that as well. Mm -hmm. um, the book is just published in December. So I, I'm getting a lot of feedback like on LinkedIn now, people reaching out to me, things like that. Um, I'm in connection with some people that's big in, big in um, diversity, equity, inclusion in the workplace. So I'll be talking to these, these people and they, and basically I'm learning the ropes of where they are to get there. 
so I can actually get more clients that way. But it is coming down the pipeline to get people to get, get follow, find an interest in what I'm trying to get out there. Now, Welby, oh, I'm sorry, Dre, did you have another part? Of no, no, no. Okay, now, Welby, let me ask. Um, now, I've known you over 30 years, <laughs> and, you know, and did not know that you were visually impaired. So let me ask about you specifically. Okay. Ask about the book. And my terminology may be wrong, so you can educate me. Do you have like 30% vision, 50% vision? What's the ter proper term? Uh, man, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I forgot what my vision is. I've been born this way, so I'm going to tell you this. So I, I was born what they call optic atrophy and nystagmus. Act, optic atrophy is I'm severely nearsighted to the point that I'm considered to be legally blind. And like my glasses I have on, you know, like normal, like you guys, your glasses probably corrective vision, bring y'all's vision back to 2020. Mine don't even bring me close. Mine is, is basically this an A. So I'm still not even close to 2020 with my glasses on. And then I have nystagmus. Nystagmus is I can't control the left eye, the left muscle of my eye. So my eye, it'll repetitively shake at times, uncontrollably, and always happen at the odd times. <laughs> but it, yeah. yeah, but. That that's it. So I'm severely I'm severely nearsighted, and I'm by the government stands I'm considered to be legally blind. Okay, got you. Now mm -hmm. let's get into the book specifically because uh, we always say on here we're the show for the shameless plug. You know we want anybody <laughs> you know that comes on our show we want to promote what you're doing. So a lot of times they'll be hesitant. Can I talk about this? We like yeah, talk about it. You know? <laughs> Okay. promote it so I know a lot of times I'm on YouTube and I'm watching like I think Tommy Davidson has a book out um uh Dr. Dre not the Dr. Dre the musical producer but the one that was on Yo MTV rap yeah yeah, yeah. You know? so they'll give you little tidbits and then when you keep delving into more questions they'll be like you gotta buy the book you gotta buy <laughs> right, the book. right right <laughs> you right, know? right so I want to get into a couple of tidbits uh, from your book, of course, we won't delve too much into them because okay. we want to go out and buy the book. Um, <laughs> so let me see. I was looking at um, some of the stories that you had uh, shared with me that are some of your, your favorite stories from the book. Okay. Um, why don't you? Why don't we talk uh, about Dr. Mona job interview? Oh, at, Dr. Mona McCarra. So yes, this lady, this lady, she's a um, she's blind, totally blind. She's a professor. At uh, I don't know if you guys familiar Northeastern University up in Boston. Boston, yeah. Yeah, and she does. She's a she does like, but I think infectious disease and, and bioengineering, something like that. And so how how I found her is I was doing some research for my book, and I was going into it's an organization called Lighthouse for the Blind. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that? They got chapters all over the country, but San Francisco has like a big chapter, and to the point that she was on a podcast in London. And where, I'm, let me give, I'm gonna educate you guys something about somebody like blind or vision impaired. So we typically don't like for people to just come up to us and ask us for help, especially if we're moving along on our own. So we want, we want to feel that independence. So in London, they had a policy, if you ride the loop and you, you have a disability, you have to have somebody walk you around. <laughs> okay. So she disrupted all of London because she told him, no, I'm like, I don't need your help. Leave me alone. I mean, all the time. So she ended up being put on a, a London podcast while she's there talking about this story. So I said, I want to interview her. So Dr. Marquera, so she had just got her doctorate. And so now she's going to apply for jobs. And she went to Temple University, but it was university in, in, in the Midwest. And so, you know, we don't, you don't, you don't have to disclose your disability to an employer and to, unless you get hired, then you have to tell them like, hey, I need these accommodations. But before they get hired, you you don't have to, it's against the law for them to try to make you disclose what your disability is or even talk about it. Now I could talk about it if I choose to, but I don't have to. So she, she said, she told me, she said, I want to be open about everything about me. So when she applied for these jobs, she let them know that I'm, I'm totally blind. I require, I use, a, I use a, a guy cane. I need these type of accommodations to be able to do my job. Cause she didn't want to get, get a job and get hired. And then they find out, well, we can't do this. We don't want to do this. She want to be totally upfront. So she goes to, they fly her in for the interview. And so she meets with the, her, the, the, the head of her department. She meets her coworkers she'll be working with. 
Then they wanted to go meet with the with the chair of the hiring committee. This is a, this is a white guy, older white guy got old school ways. She said the first when he first got into his office, first thing out of his mouth was even hello. He said you're blind. How you gonna how you gonna do this job? You're blind. She said yeah I'm blind. Yeah, but I understand we made a mistake. You know I don't know if you're gonna be able to do this job. And she finally got to the point. She told me, said, why are you fly me out? Because you knew I was buying before I got here. And stuff like that. And he's like, I don't know. I don't know. And it got to the point that she came back to the, the department head. She said, I don't know if I want to be here. And she told her what happened. And they end up firing this guy because I guess he she was the last draw. Because I guess he had done this before. So she he fired, they fired him. Then they called her back, which and this is crazy. When she got back, the new guy that was in charge, he basically was kind of like insinuating, like, you got him fired. And I'm like, what? He said, yeah. So she said, I just don't want to work here. She said, y'all can just find me back home. I'm good. But And I commend her for that. But yeah, it's, it, it's something. Now, they probably, they fired him because they didn't want to have lawsuits. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. He, probably, he probably would have brought some lawsuits. <laughs> now, you made me think of another question um, I want to ask, and then I want to go into another uh, story from the book. I know I, you know, when I apply for jobs, I guess everybody in here has a, done a, a job application, especially those online. And they always ask about, do you have a disability? Well, since I don't have one, I never thought about it. You know, I just say no and move mm -hmm, on to the next mm -hmm. section. Now, if someone does have a disability, I guess that's optional. And of course, this is just your personal opinion, you know, uh, what do you think if someone does have a disability, should they be open and honest right then on the application or the, should they say they choose not to disclose and keep moving forward? Um, they don't have to answer that question. Actually, they shouldn't have the questions on there right. for the ADA, but I see them I know, on there I know all the time. Yeah, but I, I know companies do. So what I do is I don't, I don't answer the question. I wait to the interview because in my mind, if I answer the question truthfully at that point, they're not going to call me for an interview. I'm gonna share a story. So I got I, that I had an interview, and what I and this kind of like happened to me. So I was I'm, when I first got out of college, one of my first jobs was working with an at risk program, helping at risk youth get jobs, get in school, and get into the military. It's called the Joshua High, Joshua High Graduates Program, job. And I, at this point, when I it was, I think I was in like eight or nine years. So it was time for me to find something else because I wouldn't get along with my supervisor at the time. And the company's going somewhere that I didn't want to go, things like that. So I started applying for jobs. And so this there's another organization, and it's a national known organization, I'm not gonna say the name. They had a similar job that I was doing. So I said, I'm gonna apply for this job. Go to the interview. So they 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 throwing out all these different scenarios and the same scenarios that I do on my job that I have been handling for like eight years already. So I so I'm killing the interview. I can just tell they sit on the edge of their seats. It's like two people. So you know how you, you go through the interview, you know how you got that feeling like, oh, I got this job. So they were saying, well, anything else you you want to tell us that we that we don't know about you that you didn't? And this is a question that that gets us. I said, well, yeah, I'm 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 I'm, I'm considered legally blind or vision impaired. But it, it, it should not, it would not affect me doing, doing the job. As the only thing is, I don't drive. I don't have a driver's license, but I can get around. I use public transportation. It's not a problem. It was like playing Pac-Man. It was like, game over. They hold expressions. It's like, i like, here we go. And so they, they didn't give me the job. So they sent me a letter saying all this stuff. And at that time, I was applying for all these different jobs, and this was happening. So what I did, I always used carrots to fuel me. So I would save all these rejection letters and put it in my portfolio with my resumes. So before I go to an interview, it's like preparing for a game. I'm getting my game face on by reading these negativity letters, that rejection letters I got from these different companies that, that inspired me to, to be, do good in my next interview. So yeah, so you, 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 you handle that way because you don't know what's going to happen. I guess to my view, I don't answer because I want to get the interview. I want to be able to talk. So I don't answer the question. And that's understandable. Um, in this, in, aren't there some questions that that you that they're not even supposed to ask? I mean, yeah, that if you if they ask those questions, then basically you got the job. Right. So I don't 
they're not allowed to ask you anything about your uh, disability at all until they say you're hired. Mm -hmm. Then you need to disclose, hey, well, I'm vision impaired. This is what I might need to do the job or things like that. Um, now, I can voluntarily talk to them about it, bring it up myself, but they're not allowed to ask me. But see, a lot, and, and, and what happens with that scenario, and you, you'll find a lot of people that's blind and vision impaired, we don't want to ruffle feathers, per se, because it's almost like Jackie Robinson being the first African American to play baseball. So if I'm the first vision impaired blind person on this job, if I ruffle feathers, say, hey, I need this, oh, can somebody come over and read this for me or do this for me? And I might need all this stuff. The next person ain't gonna, won't get a shot. Because they're gonna like, well, dang, he will be needed too much. We're we not gonna hire nobody else. We will just, you know, and that's what you go through. I mean, like on my job now, there's other stuff I can ask for that would really help me, but some things I just avoid it because I don't want to rough no feather. And I want you to know that I'm, I'm independent, which I am, but they, they won't perceive it that way. Let's go. Oh, I'm sorry. Was somebody else about to ask something? I could wait. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry for jumping in. You you brought up two things um, that are, that are interesting to me: being black and visually impaired. Talk about that in the workspace and some of the things you've dealt with, where both of those have worked either for or against you. So oh, you, you brought a good point. So um, that's one thing. I was when I was writing this book, I wanted to, I wanted to find another African American person that was blind or vision impaired that I could interview. And I did interview a guy, but I tried to interview the ex-governor of New York because, you know, he's, he, he's blind. And, um, but so I'm going to get this. So when, on my job that I was with, with a job program, for example, and I ain't never told this story, but I'm, I'm going to tell it on here. So I have been there like seven years at this point. And one thing about me when I'm on a job, I'm going to know everything about the company to the point I'm gonna be a I'm gonna be a, a, a valuable resource to them that they can't get rid of me. And I'm I'm that person. <laughs> take me wrong. I read the handbook. I can tell you the policy, and all this type of stuff. I knew the policy better than our HR supervisor on things. So they had this job posting for operations manager. So I, I said I'm gonna apply for this job. So I applied for the job. So like three weeks went by, like a month almost. No word about anything about this job. So I was like, man, this dude ain't said nothing to me about this job. So I went to talk to one of my friends. He's sitting on the board for Fair House and I went to talk to her one day at lunch. And she, she used to work for the company. And, and this is a white lady too. She said, well, this is what you need to do. When you go back to the office, send, send your boss an email and say, hey, I haven't heard anything about this position, but I'm, I'm still interested. So I did that. He come run over to my office. Oh, I, for, I haven't forgot about you. I'm going home to work on this tonight. So on Monday, we're going to talk about this position. Okay. So I'm thinking like, all right, I'm going to get this job. Because at this point, I found out that nobody applied for this job. Nobody else wanted it. He comes back on Monday morning. He basically broke, took the job away. Wow. Gave, spit the responsibility between me and my counterpart that worked in Medina County, who was a white guy, he didn't want no more responsibility he had. He didn't want to supervise nobody because he had retired already. He was just doing his job for residual income. He called me, said, man, what, what's going on, man? I said, I ain't want this job. I said, I know. So I'm sitting in my office analyzing this whole scenario. I said, like, is this because I'm black? Or is this because I'm vision impaired? Or is it a little bit of both? And so, I went back and talked to my friend. <laughs> she said, hey, I, can I cuss on here? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> she said, take your ass down to civil rights. <laughs> <laughs> and you file an application. I mean, you go there today. Mm -hmm. And so, and I, I worked downtown in Akron, so civil rights are right around the corner. So I called him, so I filed a claim. And so, I don't know if you guys ever deal with civil rights before. So civil rights, when you do a civil rights application, you have two options to start out. You can say, hey, go ahead and do an investigation or do you want to do a mediation first? And you know, I, 
I still, I, I, I didn't have no hard feelings. Get, business is business to me. So I didn't have no hard feelings against them at this point. So I said, you know what? I'll I, I do a mediation. She said, now if we do a mediation, some things come up, we can't use it during the investigation. I said, well, what you mean? Well, they might say some things today that the investigator might not even know nothing about. I said, okay, we still do the mediation. So I, I could be conniving at times. <laughs> so I, I knew who my, or how my CEO, how he was, because we was pretty cool. So I knew, I knew his tendencies, I knew how he was. And so I, um, I knew he was gonna come to the meeting with the company attorney. I knew I couldn't hire no attorney. So one of my buddies was laid off for his job. He, he ain't had nothing to do. I said, man, this is what I need you to do. I said, I need you to put on a suit. I'm going to give you my briefcase. I want you to walk in here with civil rights with me. You ain't got to say nothing, but I just want you to walk in with me like you're my attorney. He's like, man, what? I said, just do it. I said, man, I'll take you to lunch afterward. Just trust me. <laughs> so <laughs> we go down here to the meeting. So it's a sister, which I'm like, all right, it's good now. So she comes in for the mediation. So we sit in there. So when you first go in, everybody sits in one room together. So as I thought, he come walking in with the company attorney. I said, I knew it. I knew it. So I had my buddy just sitting there. I introduced him. So we sit in there. So we go on. So my friend, she had gave me a list of things to ask for. She said, get an apology letter. Tell her you, you want back pay from that job was posted. I mean, a whole bunch of stuff on this list. So we go down the list. And so I said that, well, at this, and I did research at the time, that type of job in Akron's paying like $45,000 a year. So I said, I want $45,000. And then my, my boss started choking. He's like, but, but he'd be making more money than the person that he would report to. They only make, they only make, no, no, no. No, no, no. I asked for something. I might not ask like 50, I think I might ask for 50,000 and he, he said they only make 45,000. Mm. So I wrote that down. So, and some other stuff. So then they break us off in, in two separate rooms. She goes back and forth. So she comes over, he said, well, he wanna give you, he wanna give you a thousand more dollars and, and, and that's it. And just, you, you do do other responsibilities. I said, a thousand dollars ain't no, that's just taxes. I, I said, I won't ever see that in my check. I said, this is what I want. I want the positive letter this, and I want $40,000. I want the position and $40,000. She said, well, Mr. Broder, you he, he told you that he can't pay more than, than what the person you report to. I said, no. He said she makes 45, so I want 40. She looked, she said, oh, you're right. So she went back in there and told him what I said. So he came back with something else. I said, no, we're done. Because she said, you can call, you can say we're done anytime. I said, we're done. And, then, and just being me, so I don't know. I don't know if you guys remember the case of is the all glass building. <laughs> so we walk out the room. So him and attorney is in the other, other room. I walk down the room. I see him in the, in the room. I bang the glass. I said, deuces, and walked out the door. <laughs> and, and so this is like at 12 o'clock. So I was supposed to go back to work. I told him, man, let's go have a drink. I ain't going to work. I ain't with them. <laughs> so and what happened is they end up doing the investigation. Of course, they found that he they couldn't afford to pay me. He took the business down because he had the money, which I still don't believe, but that's what they said. <laughs> but you again, like to Dre's point, you don't know whether it was Yeah, and I still don't know right. was it because I was black. And that's what I have to deal with as well. Because even I talked to some other people that's been buying the vision period. We go it is that that thin line, we don't know. Right. Now let me ask you, um, as we you know, as we wind down, I want to ask you this, and then get into one more story from the book, and then let our audience know where they can get the book. Um, right. Are there any break tax breaks that uh, companies get for hiring blind and visually impaired? Yeah, they so they companies who any, that hire anybody who has a disability, it's an income tax break they get. They can get for hiring employees, and then all you do have to have the like they have me fill out a form. And I, a lot of companies do this all the time. Uh, they get tax breaks. Also, they get tax breaks for providing the accessibility technology. Right. They put in a ramp for somebody who has a disability that needs that. They get tax break from all that type of stuff. Um, 
Also, companies that really can't afford that type of stuff, they get they can get grants to help them get the make accommodations, things like that. It's just that companies don't want don't, don't want to find it, take the extra step to find this stuff out, or don't have anybody to educate them on that. And I think that every company should have a an ADA person that help that, that deal with them by ADA guidelines so they don't get in trouble with the ADA. That's a good point. Now I want to get into I'm sorry, was there another question from somebody else? All right. I wanted to get into one more, uh, one more story. Now I see three stories left uh, that are some of your favorite stories from the book, but I'll let you pick between Mary Lively, senior counselor. That's the one I'm kind of partial to, but I'll let, okay. let you pick. And Mr. Banks. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, senior counselor. So okay, great. <laughs> um, so I would I would Akron book to high school, which is pretty much predominantly black. I think we had like five or six white kids and, only, and they, only, they only came there from a white school for, cause we had welding, you know, white boys like welding. <laughs> we had welding and horticulture. Hmm. So our counselor was a white lady. Was, in your senior year, they want to talk to everybody, map out, see what your plans is as you get out of high school and things like that. So mind you, I, should, I was supposed to go to a, a school for the blind and vision impaired that it was suggested to my parents way back before even kindergarten from my doctors and things like that. Cause I, I don't go to a regular eye doctor. I go to a specialist all my life. Matter of fact, I used to go to Cleveland clinic all the time. That was my eye doctor was in Cleveland clinic until I turned 18. So my parents couldn't afford it. So I went to traditional schools. Now, when I was in middle school, my counselor, she helped, she, she put me on with the blind and vision impaired services to where they got me like equipment for like sightseers, read textbook, to read the books for me, things like that. In high school, my counselor did nothing for me. You didn't, so have, a, I was, you didn't I, have a 504 plan in high school? No, nah, okay. dude, I didn't know what a 504 plan was or IEP then. I didn't have none of that. Wow. But so she wanted to meet with all the seniors. So at this point in my mind, I'm already going, I'm, I'm either going to Kent State or Akron U. My first partial was, it was Kent State. And I, sorry, Dave, but and Dr. Lou, Dr. Lewis, but yeah. But, <laughs> so when I meet her, she says, what's your plan? I said, I'm gonna go to Kent State or Akron U and I'm gonna computer science. With no hesitation, my counselor told me, she said, oh, you're not college material. I think you should just get a job. And I'm like, what? And so, at that point, I didn't hear nothing else this lady was saying. All I heard is, I was not college material. Right. So when I left out there, I was hurt and mad at the same time. But being me, I said, oh, I'm going to college now. So my mom had told me, it's like July, August, something like that. You got to tell me what school you need to go to because Kent State needs this money by, by Friday. I'm going to write this check. So one of my best friends that I grew up with, he, he was going to Kent. We already had our dorm and everything. I had with the orientation at Kent and everything. So he said his mom couldn't afford it. He couldn't go. I'm like, dang. I said, ah, man. I said, I just go to Akron. So I get to Akron U. <laughs> First freshman year. You remember mom math? Remember that mom math class with the, yes. with the professional <laughs> TV? Yes. <laughs> so, so I'm in class. I'm taking the class and doing this. So then I took, now my science was my worst subject in school, but I took earth science at 12 o'clock at, at Krauss Hall, right across from the Chuckery, from the student center. Okay. So back memories. <laughs> yeah. All my buddy, Vincent was going to lunch at 12. I, I, I see these cats going to, I'm going to okay. All right, I'm going to come over with you guys. Because in my mind, college is like high school. All I can do is memorize the book, the notes. I'm going to pass the test. Nothing told me that I need to apply what I already knew. Then I'm being a dumb freshman. I'm sitting in class taking F's on exams. So I flunked this earth science class. So my GPA was crazy low. So I get a letter from the university. I go see my advisor. So I go over there. So they said, well, you know, you, you're not ready. We think you need to sit out for a year and then come back. I'm like, oh man. Okay. So I'm still thinking like, uh, this ain't nothing, but all I'm thinking about, I got to get home, get that mail out that mailbox before my mom and dad get to the house. So 
I end up getting kicked out. My dad told me, you're going back to college, but you need to get a job because you're paying for part of it. So in my mind now, I'm still thinking about this concept, like she's winning right now. Mm. So I ended up getting a job working at Sears at Road Niggas Mall unloading trucks. I don't know if you guys are working on the dock. In the summertime, it's beating hot. In the wintertime, it's freezing cold. There's no average temperature ever. <laughs> so this is like, was saying, man, get your butt back in school because this ain't for me. So I ended up coming back to University of Akron, had to sign a contract. So I met my advisor this time. So I was reading some paper. He said, let me ask you a question. You got a vision, you got some vision issue? So I told him, he's like, oh, well, you need to go over to accessibility services. You can get a counselor over there. I don't know if you guys know Beth, Ms. Beth Olmstead. She was advising for me, this black lady over there. I remember the name. Yeah. yeah so she, she said, well, you, you got to sign this contract. So the contract basically said, you won't withdraw from any classes and you won't take any Fs. That's all right. So I signed the contract. I still got this earth science class I got to take again. Now, mind you now, I'm still working at Sears. So I'm taking a couple classes at night. So this class started at seven o'clock. So I would be in class and then knocked out. But I had a couple of friends taking notes for me. But you know how somebody take notes. They don't take the notes on what you think you take notes on. They take what they think. Like what they, I knew. I said, oh. So I'm fucking the class. Now, mind, I'm getting A's and everything else. And I know I couldn't withdraw from the class, but I knew my GPA couldn't drop either. So I said, what's the worst of two evils? If I drop this class, my GPA is going to stay the same. So I, drew, I withdrew from the class. So I had to meet with her. She said, let's see how you did. So said, you dropped your earth science class? I said, yeah. She said, I got, I got to let you go. I got to kick you out. I said, you can't give me a break. I said, no, I can't. Now, mind you, this is God working for me. I'm sitting in her office. I like, then it just came out. Well, I want to see the dean. She's like, what? I said, I'm going to go see the dean. She said, you want to see the dean? I said, yes. You saying you're going to throw me out. I want to talk to the dean about it. So we go down to the dean's office in Spicer Hall. We sitting there. Now, mind you, I ain't never know. I'm just talking. I don't know what I'm talking about. I get down to the dean's office, it's packed with people. So we sitting there about 15 minutes. She's looking at her watch. Finally she said, come on, come on with me. I said, where are we going? Now come on down to my office. She said, I'm gonna let you stay in school, but you bet not burn me. You bet not funk a class, you bet not withdraw. I said, trust me, you ain't gonna see me just to say, hey, hi and passing. I said, because what I knew at that point, if I got kicked out that day, I was never going back. I knew it. I knew it sitting in that chair. I said, if I leave this, this office today, I am never coming back to college. Right. So I ended up going back, getting all A's and B's, then withdraw and graduate. So once I graduated, my first job was working at the University of Akron in this program called the Advancing Up Program. And this program was to help people that's on welfare either get into university or help them find jobs. So I did that for like two years under Dr. Mary Williams, was a, she was over that program. And they formed a partnership with Agri Public Schools where, where they brought in kids with disabilities and taught them employability skills. And then, I, so she said, well, I'm gonna have you do this job with these kids because I don't know what's have this program. So you're gonna, basically she let me double dip to be honest. So mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, bet. So when I started doing this program, so the liaison for Agri Public Schools said, cause you know, Central Howard's on campus and that's where the kids are coming from. I want you to come down and meet your counselor. This is go back to the end of the story. So when I get down there, guess who the counselor was? <laughs> Your old counselor from high school. I said, boy, God, how God works. Right. I said, so when I get down there, she said, she said, do you, do you know her? I said, oh yeah, that's my counselor from high school. She played like she didn't remember me. Mm -hmm. When I tell people the story, they said, did you tell her? I said, no, because she knew. But mm -hmm. God knew what he's doing. Let me go back full circle to let her know, yeah, I graduated. Now I'm, I got a college degree and I'm working with your kids. <laughs> that's an amazing story and that's in the book yeah that's in the book that, <laughs> that's in the first that's in the, in the introduction <laughs> okay now doc dre before we get into uh having well be tell us where tell our audience where they can get the book do you all have any other questions before we get into that yeah oh, oh one question now in the beginning you said that this book was mostly for um hr and businesses and whatnot but it seems to me, is it, it sounds like this is also something that would be good for um, 
people who are visually in, in, impaired and and their families, you know, to keep them, yeah. so uh, I have. you know, keep them, uh, um, provide advocacy for them as well and mm -hmm. support. Yeah, so I had a few people like my cousin, her boss bought a book for her son who's visually impaired. And I had a few people who are visually impaired actually buy the book as well. So yeah, it's, it's also, it, it could be like a, a, a motivator for people who's blind and visually impaired, let them know that we can't do it because when you have somebody that's blind and visually impaired, you have two, you have two crowds. You had the crowds who want to do something, who want to be something else than just be a visually impaired person. Then you had those people who's content. I can get a check. I can get some assistance. I don't care about anything else. And it's it's amazing. You guys don't, you guys probably never see this unless you go to like a blind center, you'll see it. I mean, because you had both sides in the same room together. And then we'll battle about different things because they don't care. They want to party and all that type of stuff. Well, let me do this, do this, do that. You know, so yeah, you know, it's a motivator book. I definitely agree with that. I was thinking the same thing. Do, uh, is there a braille version or do when blind and visually impaired, when they want a book, they have to like order a special braille version on their own. How does that work? So now they, they get audio books. So actually, I'm actually, so when I went through new degree, my publishing company had the option to do the, the paper. Everybody does a paperback. You do a hard copy and an audio book. So mm -hmm. do my, my pre-sale campaign. I had, I didn't raise enough to do all three. So I thought I was gonna be stuck with just a paperback and a hardcover. So I, I negotiated with them. I said, well, I don't want no hardcover. I'm, I said, I'm in it for the work. I'm not, you know, I'm not in it just to say, I got a hardcover book. That's not what I'm about. I said, we, can I do away with the hardcover? Cause I, I definitely want to get an audio book because for the blind and vision impaired community. So they like, yeah, we let you do that. So I'm in the process of recording my audio book now, actually. Now you keep saying things and lead me to other questions. You know, since audio books, I guess in the last few years have become so popular, is Braille kind of becoming obsolete? So some people prefer to use Braille. I mean, let me say, Braille has always been obsolete to me. Okay. Um, I know people that use Braille, but I don't know Braille. They was always telling me to take Braille, but I just couldn't get into just touching dots. Because in my mind, I'm still going to look down. Like then I realized, then you get lost. Where I think it's easier for somebody who is blind because they don't see the dots, I guess per se. Was it was harder for me. I like, I don't know, this is gonna work. But now with it with cell phones, smartphones, every cell phone device, every piece of technology required to have accessibility technology on it now. So cell phones, I can program my phone, my phone, it reads everything that happens on my phone to me. I get a voice, I can do a voice command. You can do it on your phone too. All right. So a lot of they 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 have audio books. Actually, like some of my blind friends said, make sure you make sure you do an audio book. You know, I, I, I've been getting that. Yeah. So audio book is a big thing. The, the the cell phone has really changed the game for the blind and vision impaired community, to be honest. I mean, even traveling. Like, like, like that lady, Dr. Mona McCare, she has a, a, a show called Planes, Trains, and Canes, where she leaves her apartment in Boston. And rides public transportation, go different places in the world by herself, except for a camera person. The camera person cannot help her. She just has to rely on her, her resources. She rides her cell phone, her cane to get around. And she did. She does. She has a show. She, she tried to get renewed, but she had a show called Playing Trans Cane, and that's what she did. She go. She's been over to South Africa. She's been over to Japan. And everywhere she goes, she uses public transportation the entire time. <laughs> That's all right. And where can we find that show? I'd like to check. check it's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on, on YouTube. It's okay. called Planes, Planes, Trains, and Canes with Dr. Mona McCarr. Okay. Well, with that, why don't we get into letting our audience know where they can get this book? Because, you know, like you and Dr. Holmes said, you know originally written for you know HR professionals but sounds like it's a great motivational tool not only for the um visually impaired but I think for anybody you know just oh, yeah, talking yeah. about overcoming obstacles so tell us how we can get this book so you can find it at Amazon um Barnes and Noble has on their website pretty much anywhere you can buy a book online you can go to my website broadestbizsold.com is on there yeah okay. any, any any platform is online and then 
I'm in the process of getting into some, I got some local stores here, Northeast Ohio as well, but you basically get it online pretty much anywhere, amazon.com pretty much. Okay, and we'll make sure that we put uh, all that information in the reference notes. Oh yeah, that's cool. Of this video. Well, Welby, we, and we, you know, want to definitely thank you for joining us, brother. And, you know, um, we enjoyed the conversation and much continued success with this book and this publication. This just, I, I call it a motivational tool, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate the time. And then Lord Jess, Papi, hit me one time and make it funky. I was brought up and told to have no bread.